tricky thing about it is that like you get you you become known for the things that are most popular and those are the things that are the most popular i suppose but like the variety that i actually work on is much wider than than like the 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 records that i'm known for i guess Jack, how you doing? Hi, good evening. Yeah, welcome to the Question and the Answers podcast. I appreciate you coming on. How have you been? Uh, I've been very well. Thank you for having me. Uh, yeah, like, I don't know, especially all things considered. Um, it's been a crazy time for a lot of people. Um, I've been fortunate enough to keep working for a lot of the pandemic and um, yeah, just kind of laying low. Uh, you know, yeah. Yeah. Now you are, you're currently at your studio right now, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I live at the studio. Oh, I didn't, I didn't realize that. That's, that's pretty awesome actually. Yeah. Now, now, uh, so you run the Atomic Garden uh, recording studio and you work both as an engineer, or I guess I, I would say mostly as an engineer, but you also do some production, like, you know, you have credits as a producer, right? Yeah. It's a, it's a really gray area when it comes to like, credits and things like that like i've been credited as a producer um maybe more times than i would consider that i've been a producer <laughs> right yeah because um yeah yeah because i i mean so you know for for people who do not know who, who jack is so jack shirley is a uh, engineer who runs the atomic garden in oakland california he also is a musician he's been in a few bands over the years uh most recently you've, you've been in a project called everybody row but then prior to that um, you were in this band called Comadre for a number of years, who uh, is pro probably the band that most people are familiar uh, with sure. you performing in. Um, you you released a lot of uh, records, like, mostly DIY, right? Yeah, there was always some, like even when other labels were involved, it was usually um, some kind of a like label split with the band where we would we would deal with kind of everything. And then uh, maybe everything minus like PR and distribution, but we would do like all the, all the pressing details and hand, you know, we put up half the money for the pressing and like take half the pressing versus like, um, you know, a lot of times when you're, when you're dealing with a label, you get, they put up a lot of all the money. A lot of times they want to have a say in how it gets done. Uh, you get given, you know, a small chunk for free and then, and then the rest you have to buy at wholesale. Um, and we, we found that we, uh, we toured a lot. So it made more sense to, to be in on the pressing so we could have half the pressing for a cost. Um, so it was, it was just one of those things. We also like to have total creative control over everything. So it was kind of like, uh, so yeah, we were, we were always very heavily involved in, in all of it. Yeah. And I, you know, I think that for a, a lot of bands um, that can be seen as like kind of a luxury, you know, but um, it, honestly, I, I agree that that's probably like a very wise decision. If you can, if you can do it as a band yeah, in order to totally. like, not only maintain uh, a semblance of control over, you know, how the thing is going to be released and, and you know, every and every facet of the sense, right. but, um, but on top of that, like you said, like you end up having, you know, more ownership of the actual product and then you don't sure. have to worry about paying people back and like all that stuff. But, um, but yes. And so Atomic Garden has been, you know, your uh, primary focus and actually your, your job really for the last, like, what is it now like going on like over a decade now, right? Easily. Yeah. I've been, um, I've been engineering for over 17 years and I've been, it's been my primary occupation for over 15. Wow. Okay. I mean, that's awesome. That's very impressive. And, you know, um, I, I'm not sure how old you are, but um, I'm, a, I'm, I'm guessing you're like mid thirties. Like I'll be 40 in May. Oh, okay. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Like I said, I had no idea how old you were, but I mean, nonetheless, age aside, that's a very impressive feat for anyone to do, especially Thank you. In, in the time right now where, home recording has become like such a, uh, an easy thing for people to like kind of do and like, sure. um, 
you know, I, I don't, I'm sure, you know, Scott Goodrich, um, yeah. I had him on as a guest uh, a few weeks back and mm-hmm. you know, we, we talked about this at length where, you know, um, the technology has gotten as such, and it's gotten cheaper to where people can just have this stuff at home and they have pretty good quality stuff. And sure. you know, obviously some of it's not as good or whatnot, but kind of anymore, the average person with uh, a little bit of money to toss around could really have a pretty damn good studio at their home using Certainly. a computer. And so yeah. for a person like yourself to be able to own and operate a physical space um, for this amount of time and then going into it, being as busy as you've been, I mean, that's a huge accomplishment. accomplishment. So my hat's off to you. Yeah, the, the home thing, I found uh, it kind of like, it, it went full circle where people, they got it really excited and like, oh, we can just make records at home now. And I, from what I've witnessed, most people are like, oh, whoa, this is way harder than we thought. It's not just a couple microphones and like a, uh, and a computer. And so um, they come, they've ended up coming back really. And, but, but when bands come back after doing like going the home route, they have a much better understanding of how the studio works. They have a, a much, much more of appreciation for, for what can be done and all that stuff. And now they know how to demo. And so everything is just better, you know, um, or, or they have the means to do, um, you know overdubs at home or something like that but like we still do the meat of it here and then like maybe they'll send me back files to mix and and all that so there it's it is pretty crazy what um you know i've i've mixed and mastered stuff for people that was just recorded into garage band you know or like you know across the world or whatever like with with the internet is what it is and in in that kind of like technology being so accessible um it's pretty crazy what what can be done with like very little overhead yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, that's so Tsunami Bomb right now, uh, who you actually uh, mixed our last album, and you know, mm-hmm. uh, I thought you, I thought you did an excellent job, and that was that was kind of an interesting um, situation in that you know it was it was kind of a, a pretty hands off approach that that I think we all took with it, where you know we sent you uh, uh, all the music, and you know we gave you some initial kind of some notes, but for the most part, yep. we we kind of wanted you to be able to just kind of lead the charge and um you know I, I i know that with different bands you can take different approaches and whatnot but um you know in, in our experience we felt that it was really great to just let you kind of do your thing you know and sure i think for the band it was it was kind of a kind of a an act of courage on our part because like i know that in uh, i'm the new guy but the previous albums the band had done it mm-hmm. seemed like it was very hands-on and like very meticulous about the way that they sure. did everything and so this was kind of this interesting way for us to do it. And ultimately we thought that it ended up with a pretty good result or pretty awesome result, I should say. And, um, but you've worked with like a ton of awesome bands and, you know, a lot that have gotten just incredible amounts of press, like not only for the music, but for the actual recording that came out of it. And yeah, it's pretty Deaf Heaven crazy. is like probably one of the most notable ones that I can speak to. Sure. For sure. I mean, yeah, gosh, you've worked with them quite extensively, haven't you? Yeah, we, we, for um, 10 years about, I was the only person that, that worked on any of their music. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, so, so in kind of a, a way, you are almost like an extension of the band to a degree, you know, I mean, to a degree, like yeah. I mean, aspect, you know, and, and all that. Stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's actually the, the difference uh, is that to me, that's kind of where like the line between producer and engineer is, is somewhere in there. Like, yeah, I'm not like, I'm not scrutinizing the like song structures or like the arrangements, you know, things like that. Like I offer suggestions when something kind of like sticks out to me, but, but, um, but yeah, I'm not at, I, you know, I would like with a band like Def Heaven, I'd go to band practice or whatever and listen to it, you know, some, just to kind of get an idea of like what the new material sounds like, but I'm not there to help rewrite or refine songs, you know? So, um, and I, ha- I've, I've, I don't know if I've ever really gotten that deep with a band. Um, that I've recorded, you know what I mean? Where we're like pulling apart the song. Most people don't have enough time uh, or, or budget or whatever to like get that deep into it where I'm literally a member of the band who's like, you know, got a heavy hand in, in all of it. So, um, but that's fine. I mean, bands should write their own songs probably. <laughs> yeah. Like I, I, I'd imagine that, that really something like that is is best served if you truly are trying to 
I, I guess for lack of a better word, like manipulate your songs to be more poppy or more accessible where or, or sometimes ahead. it's just making them lean or something you know, or like, or like just kind of like, yeah, like trimming the fat or something like that. You know, like it doesn't, yeah, it's not necessarily poppy, but just maybe more like effective and to the point, you know? Um, but I, yeah, but you're not wrong. I mean, like that's, that's definitely one of the main goals. Yeah. Cause, um, cause to, to that point of like, it doesn't necessarily have to be about making it more pop sensible, but um, I, I I certainly have always found uh, a lot of value in going into a studio and having just a non judge well, a judgy, judgmental, but non judgy set Third of part. ears. You know what I mean? Yeah, who for sure can, can give you some feedback that's honest. And, you know, you're paying this person. So at the end of the day, you don't have to listen to anything they have to say. Right. You know, un- unless that's truly the capacity that you're, you're hiring them for. Right. But but even then it's like, well, but we don't like that idea. So we're not going to do it, you know? Sure. So the, and then you move forward. And, you know, I, I, I think that there's value in, in both sides of that, you know, uh, for any band. Because, um, mm-hmm. yeah, it, it does kind of feel like, especially when you're, I think, a younger artist or a younger musician who's like really starting to to come into your own and like you're getting better at honing at writing songs. Mm-hmm. There's still like things that need to be like cut out or, or maybe rearranged, just even like sure. a small change can make a big difference Absolutely. in the way that a song gets, gets, you know, heard by, by mm-hmm. some, um, cause I think sometimes we're, we're, we're not our own, uh, we're not a, a worthy judge of our own music sometimes. And that, that's where it can kind of come into play. Like I, I've only a few times worked with a producer, you know, where I'm engineering and there's an, and there's an actual producer like calling the shots. Um, and it is pretty interesting. It's, it's, it's a valuable thing. Cause some people like they get too close to see it at a point and they kind of lose sight of like whatever of like, of, uh, of, I don't know, just, just being able to see things clearly. And you, you, there is a person there that you have to just trust and, and you kind of have to roll with them to some degree because I mean, theoretically they've made more records than you've made and they have more of a handle on how it all translates. And like, maybe they're a better songwriter than you, you know, like, I mean, I I've been um, on a couple records where Jeff Rosenstock is producing and, and I'm engineering a band that he's not in. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't know if Jeff makes a suggestion, you probably should listen to him because he's really good at writing songs, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it, but it's a weird, it is a weird thing to like, if, if you're a band that's never had that dynamic to all of a sudden throw it in, um, I can imagine it being a little bit, you know, daunting. Sure. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, speaking of Jeff Rosenstock, so you yeah. worked with him quite a lot too. Yeah. Um, I've done Jeff's last um, four LPs, I think. Um, I lose count. We've done a lot together, actually. I've done over, I think I've done over 10 records with Jeff between his stuff and other people's stuff. Um yeah. And it's, it's amazing. Um, he's a, he's a wonderful human being. It's a privilege just to watch him do his thing. That's awesome. Yeah. I mean, to, to be perfectly honest with you, like I I'm really not super familiar with his work. Oh, yeah. um, and you know, I, I certainly know who he is and I've heard mm-hmm. his music before, but yeah. I've just never really gone down that rabbit hole. And I probably should because yeah, I mean, it's good. I mean, his name is popping up everywhere and like on, you know, best of the year lists, like multiple sure. times in a row. And yeah. you know, the same can be said about uh, Deaf Heaven too. So sure. I mean, shoot, like having your name associated with bands like that are getting so much attention. Um, I got to ask you, so I, you must be, I mean, you're, you're, you, you mentioned right out of the gate that you've been very busy. Um, I mean, are you basically like set up for like the next like six months to a year from now? Like, well, almost? right now is a weird time, you know, um, for the last almost year, the, the calendars had to be like super fluid. Uh, and cause people are canceling things all the time. We're re or we're like rescheduling things. Somebody, you know, needs to fly from New York or whatever, like to join the session. So we have to, we have to wait three months or something, you know, until like, until that feels safe. Um, so yeah, my typical like lead time, yeah, is somewhere between like three to five months or whatever. But, um, right now we're a little bit shorter than that, but maybe it's a few months out. Um, but yeah, it, it's, I mean, I, I've been working six and seven days a week for the last like five years or more, you know? Wow. 
yeah, it's busy as hell. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, cause you offer, um, mixing and engineering and then some production quote unquote, but yeah. you do mastering. Um, yeah, I, I master the majority of the records that I work on. Um, and that's, I, I don't know, it's half out of necessity for people, you know, people just don't have the budget to like, to go to an, uh, a, a third party or whatever. And, um, and I think for a lot of people, the dynamic is good with the band and I, and we don't need, we feel like we don't need um, another set of ears or another opinion to like come in because just because you're sending something to a professional mastering engineer, doesn't mean they're going to make it necessarily sound the way you want without some like whatever, either they're going to do too much. They're going to do not enough or they're like, or their sensibility might be different than yours. I don't know. Um, most of the times when I have sent stuff off to get mastered elsewhere, um, yeah, I've either been disappointed or I've, I've been like, okay, well, yeah, that's what we would have done. So, you know, it's just like validation that like, okay, cool. Um, and then every now and again, somebody really like goes above and beyond, but, um, but for the most part, I don't know. Yeah. Actually, Jeff and I, after some kind of weird, uh, experiences with that, uh, decided like, we're not doing anything anymore because you're supposed to do it. You know, like you're not, you're not supposed to master your own records. Um, but if you've done it now, I've been doing it since I started. So, uh, you know, in the beginning, mastering was probably the downfall of like a lot of my mixes. Um, and now I, uh, I feel like I'm a lot better at mastering than I've ever have been. Yeah. I mean, you know, and I, I think that this is a question that, that I'm sure you get asked all the time and I, I'm even, sometimes a little bit curious is like to learn more about it, but like, I guess if you could put it succinctly, like what is what the, is what is mastering? Like what <laughs> is mastering and why it's is a it really so common important? question? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a super common question. Yeah. Um, I have a little blurb on my website that tries to sum it up, but like to, to, to help people understand, but it is kind of like, it depends honestly. Um, but what mastering is, is the um, it's the final process between mixing and like going to like mass production or what or distribution or whatever you want to call it and so it's your last chance to make the album sound like an album you know um the biggest difference between mixing and mastering is in mixing you have access to every little detail every little thing individually you know the kick drum the snare drum whatever bass guitars vocals and you can treat all those things individually you might also treat them as a whole um, when, while you're mixing, but then when you get to mastering, typically you're dealing with a final stereo mix. So all you have is a left and a right channel. Um, and the goal is to, there's, there's a lot of stuff that, that you can take into consideration. Um, the goal is to optimize the, the record to sound as good as possible on as many playback systems as possible. So there's a lot of that is like equalization in like different styles of equalization. It could be really surgical stuff. It could be broad strokes. Um, and we could get deeper into any of that, but like the other thing you can do that you need to do is like, you know, if, if, a, if a record is mixed where each song is getting its own individual mix, um, the, the record itself might not be very cohesive from start to finish. So like part of the mastering process is like looking at all of the songs and trying to make them, trying to match them to each other to make the record sound like all the songs belong on the same record. So it could be like e evening out the volume between each song. It could be e EQing individual songs to make them all sound like similar to each other. Um, you're also um, prepping for different formats. So that, you know, vinyl or digital or CD or cassette, um, all of those could have different um, considerations. And so, yeah. Um, it's also where you decide how loud things are going to be, you know, uh, that's, that's, I think that's the thing that most people just think it's like, oh, mastering is just like making the mixes loud. And then like, that's that, but it's, it, there's, there's a lot more to it, but, um, I guess the thing to, to understand for people who are really unclear on it is that like the, uh, there's a, there's a really good book on mastering where the, the, the author explains that the perfect mix needs no mastering. Mm. So like, if everything is absolutely perfect, all like the mastering engineer could just give it a simple seal of approval saying like, yep, this is ready to go. Or 
if the mix has a lot of room to improve, uh, there could be a whole bunch of heavy processing that happens to like, to get it to be its best self, you know? Um, a lot of times, and, and so, yeah, um, because I have mastered a lot of the records that I've worked on, I do get stuff just to master a lot of times. Um, and I've found the most effective thing is to send it back and say, hey, this mix could be changed in these ways. You know, like if you do this, I can do a much better job on my end. Um, and that's been super helpful. But but anyway, I don't know. Does that help? Does that does that clarify anything? Oh, sure. Yeah. No, I I, I, I feel like I always had like a little bit of a, of a decent understanding of what it, it really meant. But mm -hmm. Um, but I, it always helps to, to learn something new. And, you, you know, I, I've certainly had albums that I've been a part of that I feel there was like a kind of a loss in translation by the time it got through mastering. And mm -hmm. I think part of that is possibly because of not fully understanding what mastering was all about. Sure. Um, like, for instance, you know, I was in this band called Good City Lies, Good City Lies Still for a few years, and we had this first album. And you know, one of the guitar players in the band is actually a recording engineer. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, he's got his own studio and mo it was mostly like done out of his own home. And, you know, we did um, a little bit of the mixing um, with him. Mm -hmm. um, no, actually, no. Th on that album, we actually did a pretty good portion of the mixing at his studio. We mm -hmm. tracked it at Sharkbite Studio. Oh, yeah. So all the tracking was done at Sharkbite. And then the mixing was done with him. We took a long time to mix it, but then we sent it to this guy in um, Katadi at Prairie Sun oh, yeah. um, and he mastered it and we were kind of on this weird time crunch. And I think that unfortunately we kind of fell into that trap that a lot of bands fall into. We're like, oh, we got to get this done. We got to get this done. We have a release album or release date that we're doing and blah, blah, blah. Sure. And um, unfortunately, I, I just remember the look on my guitarist face. He's like, dude what what the hell did he do to my mix dude what did he oh, do? No. Yeah. and i honestly i think didn't have enough of a discerning ear to fully like understand what, sure. what he was talking about mm -hmm. the only thing i could tell was that it did seem like it was kind of bass heavy you know sure. um in hindsight i do maybe wonder if if us doing our own mixing part of you know might have been part of the issue too is that you know we mixed it a certain way and then like we had this expectation and then this it's, guy who's like a it's also gray man like like yeah. the other thing too is it like yeah you know you might send it to a professional who like has a taste that doesn't align with yours you know like there's no um there there's so many versions of acceptable and good that like it, it all just boils down to like you know it has to sound the way you want in the end um but yeah it's a it it can be really hard to nail that down some people aren't good at explaining the way that they want it to sound you know um yeah so there's a whole there's a whole like i don't even know there's a whole like philosophy to how to decipher that stuff from musicians in particular yeah and, and i imagine that as an engineer you know who works with a a, a, a huge dynamic variety of, of artists sure. you know yeah um you've probably gotten a little bit better at being able to to maneuver through that language a little bit better, so that when somebody yeah, yeah. when somebody says something to you, it's a little bit more vague. Like, well, we're going for something that sounds a little bit more like Nirvana or something, you know. Yeah. Then you can kind of interpret that and say, okay, like they're sure. going to use they want to use these kind of cabinets with these kind of amps, and you know, they're maybe use these sure. kind of like filters, like whatever. But um, but yeah, I mean, because I I mean, I can remember using phrases like that you know when i went in and it's like well you know we're going for something that kind of sounds like this album or something you know and i mean that's helpful honestly that that's like for when people can't explain you know what it what what they want to hear it's best to say like well what are some albums that you really like or you know that you like the sound of and it's important to differentiate the difference between an album that you just like because the songs are really good or an album that you like because it actually sounds really good and so and those are usually two very different things, you know, like, like half the time when somebody gives me a reference for, for sound, it's, it's not because they like the sound, it's because they like the band and they like the songs or whatever. And so you have to, it's, it's important to kind of get into that, to be like, well, I could make your record sound like this, but I think you'd be really disappointed, you know? So like, you have to like, you got, I don't know, it's a lot to navigate, but, um, but yeah, you just have to know the questions to ask really. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, uh, curious over the years, uh, I mean, cause you know, you, you've had this long-term relationship with bands like 
Death Heaven and Jeff Rosenstock. Yeah. Are there any bands that you've had like uh, like one you know uh, shot with that you really felt like super proud of the output? And I mean, I'm sure that you are you know pretty stoked on like everything you've done for the most part. But like, does I mean, it kind of stand out? You know, <laughs> I, I'm at a stage right now where I wish I could re like record and, and or remix like every record I've ever worked on. Um, but cause I, in, uh, in those quarantine in particular, I kind of like went to the, into the weeds of like mixing and mastering and stuff like that. And I feel like right now it's, it, everything's sounding like much better than it ever has. And I, I wish I could go and <laughs> redo shit. Uh, I don't know. I mean, yeah, to some degree, um, most, most records that I've worked on have been a positive experience. Um, I either like the music or I like the people or the process is educational. Like it's always educational to some degree. Um, and there's plenty of bands. Sure. Where I, um, where we got one shot and I feel like we did pretty good. Um, but Jesus, it's been so long, man. There's been so many records. Uh, the first thing to pop into my mind is that band classics of love. Um, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I did their, I think it's their last full length or like, I know, I know Jesse's just kind of re, he's starting kind of fresh with the same name um, just recently, but it, when um, the last record he did with the hard girls um, dudes on as the band, uh, I did that record. And that was amazing mm -hmm. uh, to have um, like, I mean, the operation Abbey record is, is on my top five that we're going to talk about later. Uh, and to have Jesse Michaels, like in my vocal booth and he's like asking me what I think about the take he just did. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but I really like how that record turned out. I mean, like, um, you know, there's, I don't know, there's dozens more that, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, but thankfully actually, um, and surprisingly over the years, the bands that, we do really well with they pretty much always come back and so that that's even better because it it, it always sounds better the next time um because everybody knows what to expect and you know i don't know it just it's like you pick up where you left off the time before yeah yeah totally and i mean like i mean i'm, I'm cruising through your, your oh wikipedia yeah please. right now and i'm sorry yeah please ha have at it well, yeah, I'm cruising through your Wikipedia. And I mean, you know, a lot of these bands I'm certainly familiar with and I've, I've heard them. I mean, shoot, I own several of these records, but like like awesome. uh, one of them that stands out to me that I love is uh, the Super Unison uh, Auto record. Oh, yeah. Like, I love that record. Um, State Faults, Clairvoyant sounds great. Uh, Gouge Away, Burnt Sugar is another great record. Oh, man, that record was so, so fun. And, and those kids are amazing. And uh, yeah. Very cool. That so yeah, that rec like I wish more people would do records like that one. Uh mm. there was no computer on that record. Oh, really? Yeah. That yeah, was super, super fun. They so were like straight they through were the committed. console onto the, the tape? We did uh well, so like um I trap like we not to get too deep into this. Uh I liked where you're going with the with the list there, but um but the no computer at all, except for the final mix capture. So everything's tracked to tape, everything was mixed manually on the console. Um, pretty much all the records I do are track to tape though. I don't, we don't usually use, I don't usually use Pro Tools while I'm recording mm -hmm. um, just for mixing um, and, and for maybe for at the end of tracking, if we run out of tracks, but, uh, but anyway, but on the gadget way one, it's one of the few times that, that a band is fully committed to like, we're not going to use a computer to make the record. And, it, and it's like, there's so many happy accidents and like a fun workarounds and shit like that. Anyway, I love that record. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, I mean, I remember hearing that record for the first time and being like, dude, this is really good. Like this, like just yeah, kind of crushes in my mind a little bit, like how good that record is. And that like, was a record um, that I would say I, that I produced. Yeah. It's, it's, it's super great. And like, like this band torso, I know is like kind of getting a lot of recognition, you know, lately. Sure. Um, I mean, shoot, I, I listen to that stuff and it's like just right in your face. It's like wonderful. Yeah. They're awesome. Um, I mean, as, as problematic as I know that this band is like uh, that band were, um, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean like, but dude, those records, those records sound very good, you know? Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a, uh, we don't need to get too deep into that, but like, right. uh, they, um, yeah, <laughs> those, those, we did, we did a lot of records together. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I didn't, I didn't mean to bring them up because no, of okay. like any, anything in particular. I, I think that the, the, the the quality that you helped to bring out of those records is really the point of what I was trying to oh, yeah, no, no, talk about since course. we're talking to you. Um, 
and you know people can have their opinions about the band all they want but sure. um but yeah i mean it's it's a really awesome list that you've worked with and you know i'm, I'm curious it, um I, I mean you've worked with bands that are outside of like the like the i guess for lack of a better word like post hardcore or like um yeah. heavier sound but um i mean is this in general the 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 types of bands that you would say that you prefer to work with or maybe that you're best at i mean uh oof, i don't even i mean the uh the the tricky thing about it is that like you get you you become known for the things that are most popular and those are the things that are the most popular i suppose but like the variety that I actually work on is much wider than, than like the, the, the records that I'm known for, I guess. So, um, so I don't know. I don't necessarily go to one genre in, in like in particular, uh, because I like all of it. I mean, I, I do like most of what I do is guitar music, you know, whether it's like punk or indie rock or hardcore or whatever, I don't tend to do a lot of metal. Um, because my production style is like more, organic i think than a lot of um metal production is but um but uh yeah so i don't know i mean i feel like i'm um when it comes to guitar music it's it's kind of the the approach is really similar like doing a like a gulch record like we were just like i'm just doing versus doing like a rosenstock record or doing like um i don't even know or like some indie rock stuff like it's not that different um how we how i record the bands how how the kind of balance i'm looking for in a mix or a master you know so like and and half the time um i talk about this a lot like it's um the way the records turn out has gotten some positive attention and all that stuff and i'd love to take the credit but most of the time i'm just doing what the band tells me to do you know like make it sound like this fuck it up even more than that like make this super crazy sounding you know and it's like okay cool like here like like this and they're like yep so like it's it's a lot of like there's a lot of interaction and there's and 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 i really have to give credit it's really about like the vision of the bands that come through you know and like i help them decipher the thoughts and like get them to come out of the speakers in the way that they want but like but yeah it's the bands that sound that way you know right yeah. And I, and I think that that's a really important thing for people to, to understand. Like, so mm-hmm. when, when they come to you, you know, and you have all this knowledge and you have all this experience and you understand like your, um, your gear, you know, and I sure. mean, I mean, well, you've, you've also recorded in other studios, right? Yeah, I have uh, a handful of times and, um, yeah, it's, I don't know. I, I don't prefer it, but, it, but it's been, it, it's, it's been like a fun adventure. To, to go to some different places and just kind of experience some different spots. Um, but unless we're going to go to some crazy place, I don't know, like I'd much rather be in my own spot. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I, what I was about to, to, to point to is like, you have all this experience and all this knowledge and that's kind of part of what they're paying for, you know, sure, when they yeah. pay you is like, you understand how this works. You know how to manipulate it the right way so that when they trans, when they say something to you, you're going to be able to swiftly come in, do something. Hopefully that's what they wanted. And then you move on, you know, so, so and, that they and don't on, get that, stuck. That's, yeah. Yeah. That, that's the majority of what they're paying for to, you know what I mean? Like, I, cause there's in the, in the wrong hands, like none of the gear is going to do you any good. You know, like if, if the, if the person at the helm is not like on the same page as you um, yeah, it really is about like just understanding what people want. Yeah. And I think, I think like to, to what you were talking about earlier with the home gear, um, I'd imagine that, that really for most people, the benefit of having the home gear right now is to kind of help themselves become better at demoing so that they can come to you with a fully fleshed out idea so that you can then hear that and say, okay, like I understand the idea and I'm going to help you take it to the, the next level you know, sure. with, with my gear, that's maybe a little bit nicer or like more robust, or I have some sure. other, you know, stuff that's like trickling my sleeve or whatnot, but no, that, that's, that's awesome, man. And I mean, um, you know, we certainly had a great experience with you doing our mix. I mean, maybe, you know, down the road, we'd love to come in there and actually like record with you, you know, I mean, I mean, it would be different. Bad. It'd be a lot different. I, oh, I I'm sure. Yeah. Like the, the, um, the, 
I don't know, like the real business of, of if when I'm making a record is, is on capture. It's like the mixing. Usually when I'm mixing something that I've recorded, it's not like it's mostly like pushing faders around and getting the balance to sound right. Like you're not remaking it necessarily. Um, but like, but yeah, the, the tracking is so important and just like the way things are set up and the way things are mic'd and like the band playing together all at once, you know, like all that, all that stuff. Um, so yeah, I, I would love for you to, to experience that. A lot of people, um, I don't know, there's, I feel like over the years I've been kind of like a, I don't even like a, like the cool uncle or something like that, where like people come like, whoa, recordings this easy. Like we just play it in a room and it sounds like a record. And it's like, yep, it's that easy. Uh, it doesn't need to be this like painful uh, process where you, you know, you leave hating the record you just made because it was such a fucking nightmare. Yeah. You, you know, I'm, I'm curious. So do the majority of the bands who come to record with you, um do they tend to record all at once for like the basic tracking like is that yeah. your preferred method absolutely i like uh i so yeah my my preference is the band plays all together sometimes that means they're all in the same room like amps and drums and the whole thing like when we do jeff's records they're just a bunch of dudes in a room nobody wears head like usually no headphones and they're just like playing really loud like they would play at practice or a show um or uh yeah and, and if and if we're looking for like a, a more polished situation we might put like the amps in a booth or whatever but like the playing is still alive to me that's super important um and then yeah we go to tape um i like the limitations of, of using tape to track um I, I like the sound of it a lot better and then um yeah and i tell i used to tell people like hey i'll do whatever you want like you know whatever whatever you know is most comfortable but these days i need i need a really good reason to not do those th some of those things you know like most bands are a little like not most bands a lot of bands are just like oh cool we can just play the way we play some people are like kind of worried of, that the live thing is going to be like oh well what if we make a mistake it's like well we can fix the mistake You're like you know like it's it doesn't need to be an absolute perfect take you know like but it's about the energy of everybody playing together and like the ebb and flow of like, you know, people playing off each other. And so, you know, or people are scared about tape. They think that like, there's no editing possibilities or like, how are we going to punch in? It's on tape. It's like, well, it's all this, you know, it's not, it's not that different um, than recording to a computer. Um, so, so yeah. So these days, if somebody doesn't want to record live, I usually need to be convinced. And if somebody doesn't want to use a tape machine, I usually needs to be convinced. To, to be convinced that there's a really good reason to not do it. Um, and, and, and that's possible for sure. Um, I'm also kind of like anti, I'm not anti click track, but I'm pretty stoked when people don't use one because I feel like it just feels more like people playing, you know? Right. Um, so, but again, yeah. Um, I try to be as flexible as possible, but at the same time I've done it so many times that like, and, and I've just developed preferences based on what I think ends up sounding better or like feeling better in the end. And so that's my, that's kind of my thing these days. It's just like, you know, I, I educate as best I can to be like, Hey, I think you're making a mistake and here's the consequences of what you're about to do. And if they say like, yep, we understand we want that. And, and then it's like, fantastic. Like, let's, you know, let's go. I'll, I'll, I will do anything you want. As long as you understand, you know, the ups and downs of it. Yeah. Cause I mean, as somebody who is in your position, like it, it, it seems like it would be so easy for any band that comes in, especially like a band that you don't already have like an established relationship with where yeah. on the back end, they're like, well, it's, it's our engineer's fault, you know, that, that we don't sound as good as we should. And it's like, <laughs> no dude, like I was there the whole time, <laughs> like, you know, right. we did this together. So, and I asked you questions the whole time. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm super grateful of like every experience that I've ever had with any engineer. I mean, I've learned a lot over the years working with different engineers in different capacities. Sure. Yeah. Some experiences have been really great. Some of them have been not so great. And I mean, um, I mean, sometimes like, I mean, I don't, I don't feel like you are the type of person that has any kind of ego around your work, which no. is like really kind of great and refreshing. Cause I think there are some people that do have some weird like ego trips around like their production and like their engineering. Where their name um, is kind of precious and they're worried about like how everything turns out because of what people are going to think of them. You mean? Right. And, and, yeah. you know, uh, you mentioned something earlier about like, 
kind of setting boundaries for yourself. And then that like, Hey, you're, you're coming into my studio and you're, you're, you're offering to pay me for my services, but I'm going to kind of draw these lines, like where I'm going to ask you, like, and I'm going to make it pretty clear up front. Like, this is what I prefer to do as mm -hmm. a, as an engineer. And I, I need you to kind of be okay with that. If you really want to get the most out of me as, as an right. engineer, you know, because I've found this to be the best approach. And if you're willing to trust me, you know, yeah. I think that you're going to get a lot out of it. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's really great that you do that up front. Um, and I mean, do, do you think that that's ever like backfired on you at all? Um, yeah, yeah, it has, but only because, um, like I had a band come in that was like doing some kind of heavier stuff and they weren't very well practiced, you know, mm -hmm. and they yeah. wanted to do everything one thing at a time. And I was kind of like, ah, I don't know. It just like, it just feels like torture to me. And, and it really takes the like life out of it and, you know, all this stuff. And so, you know, and I was like, and I was explaining the, like, um, <laughs> just the pros and cons of the live versus not live thing. And I was like, you know, some people even like, they just set up with all their stuff in the room and they just play and somebody, somebody in the band goes, oh, okay, that's awesome. Let's just do that. And I was like, okay. And like, and we did it, but then like half the band didn't know how the songs went. And so now oh, wow. like there's a lot of mistakes in the live takes and they're bleeding into the drum tracks and they're like, you know, like usually for an average band that knows how to play their songs um, when they come into the studio, uh, there's little mistakes here and there, little just momentary things. And like in a live situation where there's bleed going everywhere, it's not that big of a deal. It's like a split seconds of like an off note and you punch in the, you know, the close mic and everything's fine. But when like somebody's playing the wrong part, you know, like during some quiet, like interlude thing, like it's, that's a fucking problem. And so, and sometimes the budget is tight and you don't have room to st be like, so stop, we have to like, we have to change, we have to put the, the stuff, you know, the cabinets in the booths if like you guys aren't going to play the songs, you know, like, <laughs> and, and so you kind of have to just like roll with it. And so like, so that was, that was an instance where like, I wasn't even going for that. Like I wasn't going for them to all be like headphoneless in a room together. I was like, just play at the same time. And they kind of went, they took it all the way. Uh, and it it didn't fit them, their situation at all. But like, so yeah, other than these, like there's a couple of outliers, but otherwise for the most part, either people are way down to do it from the, from the get go. Um, or they're a little unsure. And then as soon as we start, they're like, oh man, this is amazing. Like, it doesn't even feel like we're recording. We're just playing, you know? Right. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I would, for the most part, it all works out great. Um, and I've, uh, I've, I've had bands call and say like, hey, we really like the records you do. We want to do a record with you. And I say, cool, you know, what's your process usually like? And then they explain like my, the opposite of what I would normally do. And I try to be like, well, I think the reason you might like some of the records I've done is because they weren't done that way. And, and you know, what does that mean to us now? Um, so I don't know. It's different for everybody. But like, I think if you're a band, you should probably just play like a band plays. Um, you know, you don't practice one at a time. Right. That's, that's a, that's an incredibly valuable point to make. And, you know, I, I've done both approaches before personally, yeah. and you know, they, they, they feel a lot differently. I mean, mm -hmm. they are. And mm -hmm. um, the, I mean, honestly, I personally have always felt like the ones where we tracked at least the, uh, the, the foundation tracks together always mm -hmm. sounded better, you know, yeah. like, but the ones they where just feel better. Yeah. And like, you know, I've, uh, I've been in bands where like drummers, you know, who want to track by themselves and I'm yeah. like, like completely on their own. Like, yeah. no one's, I'm like, that's fucking crazy, but okay. <laughs> and like, it and thankfully it works, you know, like if you're, especially if you're a very good drummer, but, right. um, but man, like, I don't know, like that makes me feel so uneasy, you know, but. Know. Well, and um, then, and then on top of that, it's like, when you get like, when the live thing happens, um, you have so much of a, a, a like a the perspective that you have on the recording while it's happening is so different than when you're doing everything one at a time. Like when a band's tracking live and they do a take and they come and listen to it, they're hearing like 80 percent of what the record's going to sound like. And you're right. You can make informed decisions on like, oh, this guitar tone should be different or like, oh, you shouldn't even play this part right here. You should play this other part because it's like clashing with my whatever, you know, um, and everybody's like, I feel like people are just like a little less worried about like all the minor details. 
in there just like getting trying to get the vibe right you know whereas like when you're tracking all by yourself everybody's going individually any any tiny mistake is now like under a microscope and needs to be fixed and a lot of that stuff is what gives a record character you know you don't want to just like completely fucking whitewash everybody's performance so that you could solo each one and have it sound perfect you know like it's about the like the little moments where things get a little off kilter or whatever um so that's actually why i like not using the computer whenever whenever people commit to it i'm so fucking pumped because you you literally cannot worry about the minor details because there's nothing you can do about them like you don't you don't have that surgical editing capability the way you do in a computer and um i've found that my priority lies so much more in the like big picture um with everything that that i don't know if if somebody told me tomorrow like you can never use a computer again to make a record i'd be like fuck yeah (laughs) i love it (laughs) yeah that's tight um well hey uh you know kind of a a quick question before we go into my last few questions but Mm -hmm. um uh with with uh your kind of overall production style or aesthetic i mean i I know that you don't necessarily have a, a one uh one style or whatever are there any producers that you kind of would note as being people that like i would say like influenced your, you or like that you maybe would would say are like noteworthy that maybe had a profound effect on you and like what you do sure yeah um over the last yeah 15 plus years sure there's been people that i've kind of like um you know i don't know like like uh mark trombino stuff is pretty incredible his catalog is crazy um like bleed american is like one of the most perfect sounding like rock records you know um uh kurt Ballou was was pretty influential when i was getting started you know like jane doe came out a couple of years before i started engineering you know and so like having something like that um it's a it's a high water mark to hit um uh, people like Joe Ciccarelli, who does, um, he does a lot of like the White Stripes and like Rock on Tours uh, records. Those records sound so enormous, some of them. Um, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. There's all sorts. There, there's so many people doing good stuff. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. Oh, Tom Elmhurst is a guy who does a lot of mixing for like, um, he does like, he did the Amy Winehouse record. He did like, some black keys stuff or like adele like that sort of like a lot of that like kind of like neo soul stuff um yeah there's a bunch there's and like and thankfully we're in an era now where there a lot of these people are part of like this online educational um forum or whatever and so there's all these resources where you can watch these people work intimately um and uh, it's amazing. I wish it. I wish it was available when I was getting started. I mean, I I take part now because there's there's you, you there's never, you know, you can never stop learning and getting better at what you're doing. Oh, absolutely. And and you know, I, I I imagine that because, you know, the the act of putting a microphone to a speaker cabinet and you know recording sound inherently sounds like it's not this difficult thing, but. I mean, gosh, there's so many different things that can not go right when you're trying yeah. to get the sound that you want, you know, and like figuring yeah. out like the differences between using this mic and like at this angle and with this cabinet, with this speaker and like in this room and like yeah. all that stuff. It's just like, it's like, it's like weird chemi- like chemistry kind of stuff, you know, that you have to like think of it like, yeah, you and, know, I thought it was just and, point and click, you know, and, and I forget about it sometimes. Like people are like, oh, I might record these guitars at home. And I'm like, oh yeah, recording guitars is like the easiest thing. You just put a mic on the cabinet and you're good. But I forget about the part where I'm there to be like, oh, your amp sounds really bad the way it's set up right now. Like we need to change the, like the whatever. Like there, there is a lot of little shit that can go wrong. Um, but when the amp sounds amazing, all you have to do is put the, you know, the, the, the mic right on the cabinet and you win. But, but yeah, there's a lot of factors to getting yeah. it to sound right in the first place. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, man, I'm leading up to uh, the last couple of questions uh, I have for you. Um, so, you know, who are some bands that, or artists, you know, it doesn't have to be like a band, but um, sure. who are some artists or bands that that you are really fond of that you think people may not really be aware of and mm-hmm. uh, just, you know, some that you'd like to give a, a shout out to and that people should check out? All right, I'm going to pull my list up here. Sure. I did, I did my homework. I went through my last couple of years on my calendar to see who really jumped out at me. Um, cause this is all people that I've worked with. I, I don't, I don't, I don't tend to listen. To, I don't get to listen to that much music 
that I'm not working on because I'm often just working on music. But um, okay. There's a band from Sacramento called Sun Valley Gun Club. Mm. Um, I, I, I assume that a lot of people haven't heard of this band, but this band is absolutely amazing. Their last two records, um, I don't, you know, they're on Spotify. Um, Sun Valley Gun Club. Their last two records are absolutely amazing. Um, some of the f- favorite records that I've ever worked on, probably. Um, they're indie rock band. They, um, I don't know. They're just super good. Uh, amazing songwriters, amazing musicians, totally underrated. Go get it. Um, there's a band from Wisconsin called Telethon. Mm, yeah. That does kind of like, I don't even know. It's like theatrical, like Thin Lizzy inspired, like indie pop kind of stuff. Um, we've done a handful of records together and they're like the sweetest kids and they're super good musicians and they write great music. Um, and and I, I, I assume they were brought to me because of Jeff Rosenstock, just because they're fans of Jeff Rosenstock. Um, and, and I will say that Jeff has, has kind of like steered people toward me um, inadvertently over the last 10 years i'm i'm so grateful like some of the some of my favorite records that i've gotten to work on are just because people like jeff's records and my name is on them um so yeah um speaking of that actually laura stevenson is another person that like people definitely know who laura is but i feel like laura should be famous because laura's fucking incredible um so yeah that oh and then the last one i have down here uh there's a band called mamalik it's spelled M-A-M-A-L-E-E-K. They're on Spotify as well. Um, they're a pair of brothers that I grew up with that um, are doing this kind of like, I don't even know if it's supposed to be anonymous anymore, but it was started as like a bedroom, like black metal kind of thing. And it's now morphed into a full, like a live band um, that is like kind of like really heavy, dark, like Nick Cave or something or Tom Waits, you know, like it's like, it's really cool, like heavy music. Anyway, um, their last record is amazing. And that's actually, that was one, um, it's a hundred percent live in the studio. No overdubs, um, so, you know, some minor editing. We muted some stuff here and there, but like they just recorded a record. It's like, an, I think it's close to an hour long. Um, and like it happened in the studio as it sounds on the record. Like we didn't do any overdubs. Um, and uh, yeah. Anyway, that's that's awesome. Yeah, I'll definitely check uh, those bands. I mean, I, I've heard of Sun Valley Gun Club. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that they put out some records on uh, Twenty Sided Records. That and, sounds familiar. Yeah, yeah, my buddy David's uh, label back back then. Um, and then Laura Stevenson, I, I'm definitely aware of Telethon. I know the name. Yeah, um, I'm not sure if I'm familiar with the record uh, or with. The, Dude, they did. They're not the most recent record, but the one I think two before they did a 30 song rock opera with me and they recorded it in like record time. Like we did it then like really fast, but it, um, it's incredible. It's a rock opera. It's, it's, it's 30, it's 30 songs, I believe over however long it is. It's probably 40 plus minutes or something. And like, I think there's no repeating like choruses or vocals on the record. Um, it's a huge feat for a band, like a pretty young band of just like knock some crazy shit out like that. But, um, but anyway, yeah. But their last record is called Hard Pop, and uh, it's super good. Sweet. Yeah, I'll definitely yeah. check it out. I'm going to make then... sure that, that, that what I'm is correct. I'm sorry? I'm going to make sure that what I'm saying is correct. Oh, sure. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's the name of their last record. Um, anyway. Uh, yeah, and then, um, yeah, so a question I like to throw out to everyone, um, and I know it's like kind of an, an absurd question, but um, if you were stuck with only five records to listen to for the rest of your life, what do you think uh, those records would be? It was so hard. Uh, okay. I got four pretty easily. Uh, the fifth one is still kind of eluding me, but I'll, I'll shoot from the hip at the end here. Sure. Um, the, uh, okay. First four that were just like no brainers. Uh, Refuse, The Shape of Punk to Come. Probably one of my all time favorite records. Actually, I was obsessed with the production on that record. Like from, from the moment I like understood what recording you know, was and how it worked. Um, uh, Neutral Milk Hotel in the Airplane Over the Sea, another all-time favorite record for sure. Um, it pushed me into like that crazy production. 
um those guitars on that record like they're all over jeff's records they're all over fucking everybody's we've we've i've tucked those distorted acoustic guitars into so many records at this point um uh tom waits orphans Mm. this is a cheater this is a three album box set but i'm taking it anyway because uh it's the first tom waits album that i bought and it's like it's a it's a collection of a bunch of his kind of like leftovers um but it really feels like an album but it's like a three it's a i think it's like a the lp version is like seven lps or something like that but it's so fucking good um it's it's three albums that are separated. They're called uh, Brawlers, Ballers, and Bastards. And so it's like it's like Roadhouse kind of like bl- like bluesy songs, and then it's like ballads, and then it's weirdo stuff. So it kind of like it's his three things that he does uh, best. Um, and then Operation Ivy, Energy. I mean, probably one of the first punk records I ever even heard or had or owned. You know. Um, and it still holds up so well i don't know i can't yeah it's Classic. a great record yeah um and then i don't know man there's like 20 records that i was trying to that i was trying to rotate in and out of the fifth slot it could be bruce springsteen born to run it could be paul simon graceland it could be any wilson pickett record or otis redding it could be amy winehouse back to black uh it could be acdc back in black um so i don't know i don't really have an answer for the fifth one <laughs> That's okay, man. I mean, it's, you know, whenever, whenever I, I throw this, so I usually throw this out to, to people in advance. Um, there's been yeah. I think one or two people where I've kind of dropped it on them and it's, you know, it's such an insane question to answer, especially when you, when you have like, and if like when you love music and when you love listening to music and like consuming yeah. it at like a high degree. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's I, for, for me, I know that my list like changes all the time, you know? Well, of course. Of course. You know, so it, it, like any given month, you know, it could be, you know, Smashing Pumpkins, Fugazi, Deftones, sure. you know, fucking Primus and, and I don't know, like Nirvana or something. And then the next month it would be none of those, you know? Sure. But um, I think the only one for me that would always be on the list would probably be Fugazi, you know? Yeah. Like some, some album from Fugazi and it could be any one of theirs. Cause I fucking love sure, it. Sure. 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 I mean, Oh yeah. Any bad religion record. I, well, any bad religion record before 2001 or whatever I would right. put on there. Um, yeah any like shit man yeah any tom waits record that that's my shit right there yeah um uh the inside lewin davis soundtrack has been getting really heavy rotation up in my apartment so yeah. you know who knows man yeah yeah that's funny have you ever met tom <laughs> i've never met tom i've uh i've been tempted to go and like oh actually when we did the um the everybody rose seven inch we recorded it at prairie sun in the weights room purely because it's where like mule variations was recorded. It's where like half of orphans was recorded, you know, like we, we recorded in the weights room, um, which is still probably one of the best sounding live rooms I've ever recorded in, which is not a live room. It's like a shed, it's a barn shed. Um, But yeah, I wanted to use that console and use that room and like all that shit. And and, yeah, those drums sound awesome. Yeah. I, I, I was lucky enough to record at Prairie Sun as well, uh, for, for an EP that an old band of mine did. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, man, that place, that place is really great. I mean, there's a lot of great albums have come out of that. Oh place. my God. Yeah. A lot of history for sure. Yeah. Um, and the, and the people that run that spot are, are sweethearts. Totally. Totally. Um, well, yeah. And, uh, just really briefly before we leave, um, yeah. so with, with the music that you've actually, uh, helped create like Comadre and everybody row, people can find that stuff uh, on Bandcamp and, and Spotify, or is it pretty easy to find for people? It's yeah, it's all on Spotify. Okay. Yeah. Uh-huh. I'll make sure to add a link to that. And, um, yeah, I'm going to end with a, a, a video of, uh, some Comadre stuff and thank mm-hmm. for, thank you for supplying that. Um, it was a pleasure having you on here. Great to talk to you. And, uh, I hope to talk to you real soon. Thanks, man.